Hi everybody, welcome to the 2021 Milwaukee Film Festival presented by Associated Bank. My name is Kirsten Larson and I'm the Programming Director at Milwaukee Film. And I'm so excited to be joined by the filmmaking team for the film Lutsu. So we have the director, Alice Camilleri, and our producer, Rebecca Anastasi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank, thank you. you for having us. Um, so we were so happy to be able to include the film in our program and just happy in general to be able to have a virtual film festival. Um, and so we'd love to hear how, Alex, you came up with the idea for the film or how you decided you wanted to make this film. Thanks. Well, it's such a pleasure to be a part of your festival. Um, so I grew up in neighboring Minnesota um, and uh, my parents had emigrated from Malta. So um, while I was growing up, we would come back and forth between Malta and Minnesota. And uh, it was a formative experience for me because uh, Malta is very beautiful and is often you know, used as a filming location for Hollywood films that we've all seen like Gladiator and Troy, these, often these sword and sandals sort of historical epics. Um, but it had never really portrayed itself in a film. So, uh, as I grew up and became interested in films, I kept kind of expecting for there to be something like a robust uh, multinational film uh, scene, and like there are in, in many other countries. And it never really took root, and there's a lot of reasons maybe to explain that, but it just gave me further inspiration to find a way to tell stories there. Uh, it's a place that's very close to my heart. Um, I love it. I, I've, you know, a deep love and a deep connection to it, but at the same time, I've always been an outsider. Um, but those two things, I think, working in tandem can be very fruitful to a storyteller um, to have a, a love and familiarity of something, but always to be questioning and, and wondering about it, to have a sense of mystery. And so that was certainly the case when I decided to make this film. I, I had a great sense of mystery about the world of traditional fishing because I knew nothing about it. And in fact, I'd never gone fishing in my life and uh, I'm very prone to getting seasick. So it wasn't the most natural subject matter for me, but uh, nevertheless, I felt a kind of a, a connection to the, the inner world of uh, these characters that I saw to portray. Because in my own life, I, I often thought about my connection to my heritage and what would be passed on from my parents to me and from me to my family one day if I had one. And I saw that uh, many fishermen were debating the same questions and in a sense they were also running in the opposite direction they weren't necessarily trying to hold on to their heritage but it, many were running away from it and i found that um sad in a way um that there was a we were in this eclipsing moment of the world of, of traditional fishing in malta but at the same time i recognized that many of these fishermen approached this dilemma without necessarily a sense of sentimentality. They were very clear eyed about what was happening. And uh, beneath the surface that that pain was nevertheless there. And it just seemed like such a rich uh, personal crisis to explore in a character. And, and that led me to the story that uh, that we had set out to make in, in Lutsu. Well, I feel like there's a lot to dive into there, but before we get into that, Rebecca, I'd love to hear how you got involved with the production. Well, I was um, uh, helping out on the team of a film festival here in Malta, um, the Veleta Film Festival. And um, uh, Alex, uh, I actually met Alex through that festival. And um, uh, he he said, hey, so I'm making this film. He gave me some of his ideas. He wanted to use non-actors, you know, film in real locations. And as soon as he told me that and he sort of gave me the rundown of what he was thinking and his ideas for the film, I thought to myself, you know, this could really, really work uh, for Malta because we are so used to helping out on and making other people's projects. I, I spent 15 years in the film servicing industry working on projects, um, American projects, British, German, uh, from all over the globe. And Yet, sort of, there's a there's a great movement here in Malta for people wanting to make our stories. And as soon as Alex told me what his ideas were, I said, "Okay, yes, this 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 could really work here, right?" And I love the ideas of non-actors. And um, yeah, we started uh, casting, um, well, looking around for 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 fishermen 
almost immediately because as Alex, Alex will be able to give you some more details on this. Um, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to find younger fishermen in Malta, right? Uh, a lot of them are older fishermen. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's how I, I jumped on board and uh, we shot over five weeks towards the end of 2019. Thankfully, <laughs> we missed we missed COVID. Um, uh, and, uh, and yeah, we were very lucky, very, very lucky with the weather because of course we shot out at sea as well, as well as on land. Yeah, I thought the actors in the film were amazing and I would love to hear what the casting process was like and how you sort of coached them through becoming actors. Yeah, thanks. And as Becky alluded to, um, the, the, the fishermen leads in the film are real fishermen. So um, we were determined from the very earliest inklings about this project to work with non-actors and to take real fishermen and, and turn them into, into actors. It's a challenge, as Becky alluded to, the average age of a fisherman now, I think is over 50 years old. And we needed guys kind of portraying between 25 and 40. And fishermen don't have headshots. There's no database that you can go to. So the only way to find them is to hit the road. I was lucky to work with a really fantastic uh, casting director, uh, Edward Side, and he and I hit the road and, um, went to fishing villages, spoke to people. And the funny thing that starts to happen is, um, you know, fishermen are really just, they just want to fish. So, you know, if you come, we, it might be different in other places. Like if you come proposing that you're, you're making a movie, some people might be, oh, very interested. And uh, this might be my shot at fame that fishermen don't really care uh, what kind of movie you're making. They just want to fish. So uh, making inroads wasn't always a straight line, but we, got very lucky almost at the last moment. I was coming back and forth. I live in New York City. I was going to Malta and coming back and going and coming. And on the last day that I was there um, during a casting, uh, a few weeks of casting, we hadn't found anyone. But on the last day, we, we got wind of these two guys, Jez, Mark, and David. We drove down to try to find them. And luckily, they were where we thought they would be. And normally, we would do a little bit of a song and dance and talk to them, try to butter them up a little bit, but not scare them. So, you know, then we'd go away and come back another day to see if they were still interested. Well, I didn't have time because my flight was just the next day. So I just asked, can we just go on your boat right now? And let's do a little scene. I've got a camcorder. So I went on the boat with them, described a scene, asked them to improvise it. Now bear in mind, they've never acted in their lives and they were not expecting me and Edward, the casting director, to show up that day. But what they did the first time was incredible. And they were both like magnets for the camera. I saw at that moment that like, you know, the whole film would click into place. They were bringing so much uh, with very little direction because they were in a way acting a scene out of their own life. And there was very little um, invention that they that had to come up with. And they, in fact, they did the scene better than I had originally imagined it. So we took that uh, as a, a really good sign um, for what they could bring to the whole film and applied that technique. Over the next two years, we rehearsed the film in a way, uh, rewriting the film around the rehearsals. So I would describe the scenario and act, ask them to come up with the dialogues and, and hone in on the emotion. And I would film it and then I would go back and I would write those improvisations that they came up with. I would write those into the script. And so that's how we worked over a period of two years. And in that time, they went from fishermen to really capable actors. Um, as some of the audience might know, in fact, Jez Mark, uh, the lead of the film, won the Special Jury Award for Acting at Sundance, which um, was a really, really special honor. And I, I think um, really, pays tribute to the charisma and sensitivity that he has on scene the first time doing this in his life. It's a really incredible accomplishment. Yeah, I think you all did a great job working with them and they, you're correct, they're totally magnets for the camera. So, so happy that that worked out nicely. Um, I am curious when you're talking about sort of improvising scenes with uh, your cast, how much did the story change from your original idea to the end product? 
Well, um, you know, Becky knows that the development of this film was a journey and uh, we started with a much looser idea that really became refined and especially once we'd found the cast. Uh, one of the key discoveries that I made was um, in an earlier draft of the script, the older of the two fishermen was the main character. And when I was that on the boat with them for the very first time when we were auditioning them, my camera just kept going to Jesmark. It was like drawn to him. And I was looking at the footage and just wondering why, why that was happening. And I realized that, you know, he was so, so magnetic. Uh, you couldn't take your eyes off of him. And that I had to rewrite the script around the younger of the two because it would be very strange if he was sort of halfway through the film, he disappeared and wasn't in the film as much. We would, we would want to follow him. And so um, the film just got better and better the closer that it got to the bone. And spending more time with Jesmark and David uh, exponentially improved the authenticity of, of the world that we were portraying and the, uh, the credibility of the emotion. Um, and I really relied on them. They were real partners in, in making sure that we were uh, telling a story that was authentic and that could resonate. And in fact, the, the smaller that we made it, the closer to their experience, magically it became much bigger and much broader. And in a sense, it you know, resonates as far away as Milwaukee and, and beyond um, because we really were able to hone in on the specifics. And that's really what you get with you know, working in this way with non-actors in which you have an idea, but you have to hold it loosely. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you were really striving for authenticity with this film because like you said, Malta is always being shown as something else and you wanted to show Malta as Malta. Um, what was your research process like preparing for this film, especially as a bit of an outsider? Yeah, well, um, I, my, my research was uh, hitting, hitting the road, you know, um, just spending time on the ground, being there physically, spending time with Jesmark and David uh, in their home where they fix their nets, on the boat with them. And I rely, you know, a lot on a team to, to bring things to the table. And, and, you know, Becky's one of these people. So I had the great benefit of, of course, because, you know, part of my year I'm here in New York that um, Becky's in Malta and can look into things and even help, you know, there, there are so many things that go into a film and, and not just the fishing, which is the main attraction for this, but Becky, we had to learn about so many other things. Um, neither you nor me have kids, for instance, but like we had to learn about the intricacies of uh, feeding a baby and going to the, uh, the pediatrician and, um, you could help me think of some other things like all the ingredients that go into this film. Do you have memories of other other research that we did? No, the the um, uh, yeah the aspects of the the the, the parenting aspect was a was one which uh, kind of I remember strongly, particularly since we had a meeting as well. If you recall, with a, a new mom, and we asked her how it felt, and we went through some of those emotions with her, so that. So it get, as you said, it could get right to the bone, right? The story could get uh, right to the bone, even on, in that in that aspect. Um, yes, and then in, in I know that Jez, Mark, and David were immensely, immensely uh, giving when it came to the world of fishing, uh, even even on from the production angle, right? So I would call David up, for for instance, and tell him, look, we need uh, we need. Uh, six lutsus and fishermen for this scene tomorrow and he'd tell me not a problem i will call my mates and we'll come down and we'll, we'll film like that and it, and it and that actually happened you know and, and he helped for example john and the art department our, our production designers so immensely it's it's it was just organic as alex said it was the help we got even from the wider community was immense yeah Becky reminded me that when we were meeting with the young mom who was helping us with that leg of the research, she she brought to the table something incredible that ended up in the film, which was like a wives' tale about not eating pears if you're yeah. pregnant with a boy. And it was so absurd. Uh, it had to go into the film. 
And then the best thing that happened was in, on the day when we were shooting that scene, I was speaking to the, to the actress and I, I remembered that from the research and I said, oh, can you talk about pears and how you shouldn't eat pears? And I thought that this actress would just look at me like, you know, I'd spouted like a second head. And she said, oh yeah, I can talk about that. You definitely should not eat pears. And then, and then she said, oh, because, um, and then she had a whole explanation about how it affects the urination in a, in a, in a baby boy. So then she took it in a, you know, and she, and she ran with it. So, um, I, I, you know, the, the benefits of the research come back and they, they pay you back in many, many ways. And that was just, just one of them. That's great. Um, and were you able, I know that the movie came out at Sundance already well within the pandemic, but has a Maltese audience gotten to see the film yet? No, unfortunately not. Um, uh, we're getting so many messages on our Facebook page <laughs> asking us when is this film going to come out and what. I mean, the support has been immense. When the film came out in Sundance and uh, it did so well, this was the first Maltese film to play at an A-list uh, film festival. So um uh, we were we were overwhelmed at support we were all on the on the newspapers and you know people were calling me up to interview jess mark left right and center um he he was thrilled of course uh, he was uh, lapping it up <laughs> he really enjoyed it um and it was well deserved it was really good but now we really look forward to a multi premiere later on this year we're hoping sort of towards the end of this year and uh yeah i'm really excited to to find out what people th think i mean there's a huge expectation uh, and uh, I know there's, a, a, there's, there's going to be a lot of people really keen to come and watch it. Yeah, that'll be exciting. And I want to know what they think too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know you were talking about how in Malta, there hasn't been a lot of like Maltese based films that are made there. Um, do you, is there a particular reason why that is? Um, and do you have any predictions for the future of Maltese film? Well, it's, it's a complex set of reasons, um, uh, ranging from the lack of resources and, uh, yeah, bottom line, it's lack of resources and, um, also the, you know, you get, you sort of get stuck in kind of servicing foreign film and you, you don't have time to make your own. It, it, it's, it ends up being a, a situation whereby that is not prioritized. Um, but saying that, there has been a, a change in the past few years. More and more people want to create Maltese film, look to a future of Maltese film. And there's much more activity on the ground than there was even when, when Alex and I first started, right, around four years ago. Um, uh, today, people are excited about Maltese film. And um, I, I, do see, I do see a lot of hope. Uh, um, uh, for the future for Maltese film, I think there is, there is, there there is a, a culture change happening um, on the island, and uh, and so it should be. You know, we have so many, so many stories to tell, so many interesting characters. Um, uh, I think that uh, yeah, th there's there's a lot to mine <laughs> essentially over here. <laughs> Well, we'd really look forward to hearing more stories from there. Um, Alex, I know that this film was your feature debut and I would love to hear about sort of uh, anything that surprised you from moving from like short format to feature length format. Yeah, well, um, you know, honestly, I didn't make a lot of short films and uh, my background was mainly in editing. So for me, it was a little bit more about making the bridge from being an editor to, to being a, a director. And not many editors do it. And I've kind of wondered why it is because um, I think editing is a, is a great training ground for, for, for directing um, because it's really the essence of storytelling. And certainly what I uh, took away from kind of a decade in the, in the cutting room was being able to look at a film like through an X-ray machine and to be able to see where the fault lines were, and most importantly, to understand how to correct them. And if you can correct them in the editing and take those lessons to the script phase, well, you're just made a gigantic leap in, in your own development, your own quality. And so I, I tried to take those kind of hard fought lessons from the cutting room and, and sort of get ahead of problems 
that I'd encountered working on my own and other filmmakers' films. And, um, you know, I was also really fortunate to work with really amazing filmmakers in my time as, a, as an editor. And um, I learned so much and was really treated like a collaborator and I had extraordinarily rewarding experiences was a vital part of the, the, the storytelling. And yet it still wasn't enough. You know, uh, there was still that voice saying, okay, well, this is, this is great and you're valued and you're doing something, you know, artistically um, valuable in your role as an editor, but it's still not what you want to do. And so it's, you know, we all hear those little voices in different moments of our lives. And um, it was a slow crawl out of the editing chair and into the director's chair. Um, but I'm so glad that I was able to do it. Um, I did edit this film, of course, um, that, that seemed natural. So then I ended up back in the chair. Uh, but they are, um, it's a, you know, it's a continuation of the process. I mean, the, the conventional wisdom about editing being the third rewrite is really true. And, and so the, the film thankfully landed in my lap during the pandemic and I edited it on the laptop that I'm speaking to you from now. Um, and was able to do it in my bedroom and it you know really saved me during those those long months of the pandemic and we just kept whittling away at it holding on to hope that we would have an opportunity to show it um to audiences like in milwaukee and and hopefully one day becky and i will be sitting in a theater and actually <laughs> seeing it somewhere with an audience we'll, we'll see when that is well, we absolutely love the finished product and we're so happy we're able to share it. And I wish you both the best of luck on its continued release and hopefully a theatrical release down the line. Um, but thank you both so much for joining us today and a nice virtual Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so if you're watching this Q&A and you haven't watched the movie yet, obviously you need to watch the movie. But after you watch it, you can vote for our audience award and click on the ballot on the web page that you're watching from and let us know what you think. I assume that you're going to love it, as our filmmaking team would assume as well. But beyond that, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Bye.